Bonjour, agus chia div. Welcome to The Irish in Canada, the podcast exploring the histories and legacies of Irish immigrants and their Canadian descendants. I'm your host, Jane McGaughy. This is episode number three, the 1832 cholera epidemic. Last time on The Irish in Canada, we explored some of the Irish elements in the story of Grace Marks and how derogatory 19th century stereotypes played into her role in the Kinnear Montgomery murders of 1843. Today, we'll jump back by a decade to the early 1830s, a time that helped to shape many of the anti-Irish stereotypes that were used against Irish immigrants to Canada, including young Grace. Did you know that a lot of the headlines that we've read from the beginning of COVID-19 Echo those from 1832. Deadly cholera, advice. Coming closer, vessels to be watched. Preventatives of cholera, be temperate in eating and drinking. Prevent the plague from coming over. The scourge steadily marching on. What I have found fascinating during our pandemic is how many parallels there have been to this earlier time, the cholera epidemic of 1832, and the fears that it created in Canadian society about disease, outsiders, government inefficiency, and what to do when the world seemed to have changed forever. For much of the 1820s, emigration from Britain and Ireland was seen as a great thing, a way of addressing overpopulation and strained resources, increasing access to land, buttressing the borders of the empire, and for some, removing unwanteds from society. The numbers arriving at the Port of Quebec in the late 1820s had been manageable. Between 1827 and 1829, the average was about 7,000 per year. But as people became aware of cholera making its way into Western Europe, the numbers soared. Nearly 20,000 passengers made their way across the Atlantic in 1830. The next year, that number had doubled. And in 1832, When cholera had spread to Ireland, 32,500 immigrants left everything behind, desperately trying to escape its clutches. Cholera is an infection of the small intestine, causing profuse watery diarrhea and rapid dehydration. When various cholera waves began in the 19th century, no one knew its cause or how it was transmitted. It wasn't until the 1850s that Dr. John Snow in London found that water and food contaminated with the feces of an infected person were to blame. Symptoms included low blood pressure, sunken eyes, severe cramps, a husky voice, kidney failure, and bluish skin. The afflicted could produce 10 to 30 liters of diarrhea per day. Children, the elderly, and those in bad health were the most susceptible, but the disease could kill anyone. If you felt well in the evening, you could still be dead by morning. Cholera's speed and the inability to be sure when or how long someone was contagious were terrifying. I should add that cholera is still with us. Now, however, it can be cured through rapid oral rehydration therapy, intravenous liquids, and antibiotics. In 1832, when the world suddenly seemed like it was being stalked by the disease, None of these cures were obvious or available. Things that were thought to cause cholera but didn't included bad air or miasma, poverty, low morals, and alcohol. People raced to stay ahead of the disease. As Europe's most western point, Ireland was one of the last places to be afflicted, but it was also from where everyone then tried to escape. The lag some people had between their initial infection and then showing any symptoms meant that many people boarded ships from Ireland to Canada when they were already ill. Five weeks on the ocean easily allowed the disease to spread. The conditions on the ships compounded the problem. On an overcrowded ship, drinking water could quickly become contaminated and unhygienic conditions would flourish. On June 3rd, 1832, a ship from Dublin called the Carracks arrived in Quebec City. 
There had already been 42 deaths on board from cholera during the crossing from Ireland. By June 8th, the disease was rampant in Quebec City. Within two days of that, it had spread to Montreal. A board of health was quickly struck, and fever sheds were hastily built, where sick arrivals could be held until they recovered or died. There were nearly 7,000 immigrants arriving in the second week of June alone. I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that there were a lot of mistaken ideas about how to fight the disease. Were Catholics more susceptible than Protestants? Were you more likely to fall ill on a Friday or a Monday? Perhaps depressed people would get sick more quickly, so do your best to remain cheerful. On the Plains of Abraham in Quebec City, hundreds of sick tents were erected because the hospitals were already full. Rumors spread that anyone on the Plains was walking ankle-deep in filth. People collapsed in the street. There seemed to be no way of stopping it. Someone who was sick didn't necessarily appear that way, so why would they be held back with the dying? Quickly, cholera made its way from Montreal, up the St. Lawrence River to Brockville and Kingston, and then on to Toronto and the United States. There had been some preparation by the authorities in Quebec City, but not in Montreal. In December of 1831, the Lower Canadian Legislature decided to bring in restrictive policies. More importantly, on March 26, 1832, they authorized the creation of a quarantine station on an island in the St. Lawrence River that would intercept any arriving ships before they came to Quebec City. They chose Grosil, 48 kilometers downstream. The island is almost 5 kilometers long, and 1.6 kilometers wide. Theoretically, any ships arriving from Ireland or elsewhere in Europe would have their crew and passengers examined on board and then either be put into quarantine or allowed to carry on to Quebec City. Quarantine comes from the Italian quarantena, meaning 40. In the 1400s, Venetians had used a waiting period of 40 days to prevent the Black Death from entering their city. In Canada, in 1832, the waiting period for a ship known to have come from an infected port was three days. Ships with sickness on board had to undergo a mandatory cleaning before heading to Quebec City. Ships with a confirmed cholera outbreak during their voyage had to go into quarantine for 30 days. Once on the island, all steerage and passengers from the hold below decks had to clean themselves and their baggage. Cabin passengers, however, were not required to go ashore. Class was a real killer. Determining who was sick was a tricky business. Medical officers relied on ship's masters and passengers' relatives to be honest about who was ill. More often than not, quarantine was mandated because of the passengers' cleanliness rather than their symptoms. Now, if you had a sick child or parent, or if you yourself were feeling not quite right, would you admit this to the medical officer or the ship's master, knowing you would be separated from your family and sent to a mysterious island that was full of people who were sick? Some passengers on the ships were truthful. Others were desperate. Sick relatives and children were hidden away, or made to look well for the brief time they were being inspected. The situation on the island itself quickly deteriorated. The military was in charge, and they were soon writing to their superiors for permission to punish the disobedient Irish. Healthy passengers who had been told to quarantine then did come down with cholera because of being exposed to the sick and dying. Many of them never received a second examination. Women fought for water to boil clothes and for space on the shore to dry their belongings. One of the cruelest ironies that summer was that many of those Irish women fighting for a place to wash their clothes and themselves were doing so in water that had just been contaminated by other passengers further upstream on the island. They washed, thinking they were freeing themselves of the contagion, when in reality... They were contracting it. Over 9,000 people died in Upper and Lower Canada from cholera in 1832. 
Doctors were overwhelmed, hospitals were overflowing, and fear became a major part of everyone's life. Sound familiar? Cholera remained a problem for years to come in the Canadas, and immigrants, the majority of whom were Irish in this period, were blamed. The Bishop of Montreal wrote to his cousin that one of the greatest problems in Lower Canada was, quote, the invasion of our uncultivated land by British immigrants who threatened to drive us out of our country and reduce our Canadian population year after year by the spread of disease. The Irish, bringing biological warfare to Canada since 1832. Do you remember how you felt when you heard about the second wave of COVID-19? Or the Omicron variant at the end of 2021? We've been repeating a script that was written for us nearly 200 years ago. Canada's second cholera wave came in 1834. No one wanted to believe that it was back. But it was, and not only once. Canada suffered from cholera epidemics in 1834, 1849, 1851, 1852, and 1854. Three of those years coincided with the Great Irish Famine, when millions of men, women, and children fled starvation in Ireland, and when Grosil again became a place associated with Irishness, disease, and death. But that's a story for another day. Next time on The Irish in Canada, we'll talk about something else that came from Ireland to Canada that divided society and put many people on edge. The Orange Order. Thanks for listening to The Irish in Canada. The show was researched, written, and narrated by me, Jane McGaughy. This season was edited and mixed by Patrick McMaster and produced by Marion Mulvenna. Our theme music was composed and performed by Kate Bevan Baker, and our logo was designed by Claire McCauley. Many thanks to the School of Irish Studies at Concordia University in Montreal, the Canadian Irish Studies Foundation, Le Gouvernement de Québec, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for their support. If you like the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us on your favourite podcast app. You can spread the word about the Irish in Canada by following us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Irish Canada Pod. Our website is the Irish in Canada podcast.ca. That's where you can find show notes for our episodes, including lists of sources and recommendations for further reading. Until next time, Gora Maogif. <laughs>